My pleasure to introduce Professor Stauffer. She comes to us from Texas, where it's even warmer and more comfortable than it is here. Uh, she's an associate professor of government at the University of Texas, Austin, which is a city not as cool as East Lansing, but, <laughs> but by reputation is. Uh, and uh, she's here to talk about her work on Tocqueville. So please welcome her to MSU. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dustin, for inviting me. Um, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. And I just learned, do I have this right, that y'all are Spartans? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's very appropriate then, because I don't know if you, if you, how much you sort of relate to your ancient namesake, um, but if you do, then maybe you will find a particular wisdom in this talk, because it's about Tocqueville's view of modern discontent. So that's the title, Tocqueville on Modern Discontent. And in the talk, I explore the fate of the soul in the modern democratic era, as understood by Tocqueville and uh, as conveyed by him in Democracy in America. Now, I think this work offers a great deal of insight into this topic, uh, because although at one level the book is about uh, political life in America in the 1830s. And I see copies of the book around the table, so I know um, people uh, have some familiarity with it. Um, although, at, at, on one level, it's about Jacksonian America. At another level, um, it's about something broader. And that's because, as he says in the introduction to the book, Tocqueville set out not to write a book about a narrow, specific set of political conditions, but about the world as it was shaped by the rise of a few key principles, equality above all, and also um, the sovereignty of the people. And he also says in the introduction that he uh, sought to capture the essence not just of one country or of one particular moment, but of uh, the future. He says he's speaking about the future of the modern democratic era as such. And he famously declares that we need a new political science for a world altogether new. Now, this world, the world of modern democracy, retains its essential features. But it is no longer altogether new. Indeed, it, it seems to, have, to many to have lost its shine. And many would say that it is showing signs of wear. 30 years ago, Francis Fukuyama suggested that we were approaching the end of history, an era in which all deep tensions in society had been resolved. And now, even Fukuyama himself acknowledges that that end has not come. We haven't yet achieved equality and liberty for all, certainly, but even if we were to attain those ends, it's now clear that that would not mark the end of strife. So we haven't... Um, the achievements that we have, uh, that have emerged out of modern liberal democracy may be considerable, but they don't resolve all the contradictions in human society or in the human soul. Now, we need not take our bearings by the mood of the immediate moment, um, nor by the consensus of public intellectuals. But, as it happens, if we do that, um, we find plenty of confirmation of a pervasive discontent. So, um, for example, we have just marked the close of a decade, right? a time for great reflection. And uh, Politico recently asked 23 historians to uh, comment on the 2010s. I don't know if any of you saw this, but they said they asked all of these uh, eminent historians, comment on this decade, comment on um, you know, how it will be viewed by history. They asked them to characterize it. And their responses ranged from gloomy and pessimistic to pretty close to apocalyptic. So, uh, for example, here are some of the highlights. One called it a period of paralysis and saw a United States more deeply divided and directionless than it had been in half a century. That's sort of a tame one. Another called the 2010s an era of venomous division. Uh, still another saw in the 2010s, poisonous anger, an extreme polarization that is normally the hallmark of defeated and bankrupted states on the verge of collapse. 2010 to 2020, yet another historian wrote, was the decade when we saw how our democracy would end. So, uh, Jeremy Surrey sums up the con uh, consensus of the lot, calling the 2010s, in short, an ugly time. So, the only positives that any of them saw 
any of the 23 were of the character of what Machiavelli calls opportunities for greatness, meaning that the conditions are so disastrous and so miserable that someone might come to greatness by attempting to address them. Uh, and it doesn't take a historian to see the mood of the moment, right? We see it all around us. We are confronted daily with political polarization and dysfunction, with eroding trust and declining engagement, with apathy and indifference, uh, with bitterness and vision, with the rise of populism and an angry nationalism. So that's at the political level. Um, and in terms of individual well-being, we don't seem to be doing very well either. The number of people in America who report being happy is low and dropping. So uh, according to the World Happiness Report, and there is such a thing, we are now the 19th happiest country in the study. And there's not that many more countries in the study. Um, and even the average life expectancy of Americans is declining. Um, and it has been now for three straight years. So discontent is all around us. The symptoms of illness are clear, both to, the, to those that are looking at the immediate moment, people like historians that are writing blurbs for Politico, and also to those who take the longer view and try to think about the, mod, the conditions of modern liberalism itself. But we struggle for precise causes or a precise diagnosis of the causes of our discontent. And I think that Tocqueville speaks to those causes throughout democracy in America, um, but especially in the second volume. And so most of what I have to say comes from the second volume. And he speaks to those, um, to the causes of our discontent in, in the broadest possible way, not by looking at a particular decade, but by considering how modern democracy, which is the fundamental fact moral and political fact of our time, interacts with human nature and shapes our lives. And in Tocqueville's account, the modern democratic soul is restless and agitated by desires that it can feel but not fulfill. And not only do certain desires go unfulfilled in our time, but they also go unrecognized. For, as I'll try to explain, modern democracy not only thwarts certain longings and inclinations, according to Tocqueville, but it also obscures them from view. So what I'm going to do is talk um, about three things. Uh, the talk has basically three parts. First, I'll talk about Tocqueville's account of the state of the American soul, so just what that, ac what that account is. And then I'll turn to his analysis of how democracy contributes to our discontent, or how it creates a problematic psychological environment. And then most important, I will discuss his understanding of what happens to frustrated longings um, in the modern democratic era, the, the parts of the soul that are, not, um, that are hard to satisfy in uh, the modern democratic era. Because his analysis goes beyond the thought that certain longings and impulses are suppressed or that they don't go, you know, they just go unsatisfied. That's certainly part of his analysis. Um, but he has a fuller treatment of the situation. And that's the thing that um, I want to focus on that I think is the most interesting part of his, um, of what he, what, we, what he has to teach us. Now, like the historians, what I have to say will be almost exclusively negative. So I want to begin by at least mentioning the positive aspects of the spiritual effects of democracy as Tocqueville saw them, because he certainly did see so. So Tocqueville, to, to start with the positive then, Tocqueville saw democracy as deeply energizing to American society. He was amazed by the levels of activity that he saw here. And it was the first thing he wrote in his journal when he arrived on our shores. Uh, the whole place seemed to be in motion, he said. So he marveled at American productivity and our capacity for collective action in things like building schools and hospitals and roads and bridges and that sort of stuff. So he, he was amazed by how active we were, and he thought that the vitality of American society was rooted in several things, but he thought that democracy was one of the most important sources of our vitality, because democracy opens up the possibility that people can improve their condition through work. So it, you know, it, it makes sense that 
democracy taps into a potential for industriousness in people, in ordinary people that had lain dormant in aristocratic societies where um, peasants didn't have any particular reason to, you know, um, want to build new things or um, engage in, you know, uh, new enterprises. Now, at the same time that it was becoming possible to improve one's uh, material conditions, an important change was occurring in people's moral outlook, according to Tocqueville. And that was that the stigma that was once associated with the pursuit of self-interest was wearing away. So people were beginning to feel that self-concern was respectable and legitimate, and they didn't feel ashamed or apologetic about pursuing um, their own self-interest, about trying to improve their economic um, or social position. And in addition, Tocqueville thought that American democracy was enlivening because it gave ordinary people a sense of ownership over their communities, a sense that they were stakeholders in their communities, and the success of their communities was also their success. So he argues that enfranchising ordinary people, bringing them into the political community, you know, giving them a vote, making them part of the sovereign body, empowering them, gave rise to this new and very powerful type of civic spiritedness. And in earlier eras, he says, people might have been capable of a different kind of civic spiritedness, a very great devotion to their king, let's say, on the battlefield. Uh, but in America, he observed people serving their communities because it made sense to do so, because they saw their own good in those, in those communities. And one of the things he's most famous for is his, um, uh, how he marvels at the New England towns. Um, I have a soft spot for this because I'm from one of those towns. Um, and he says, you know, ordinary people are, are governing themselves in these towns in this, you know, um, uh, incredible way. And they have this, these towns have this great spirit. And that spirit that he saw was one form of this civic spiritedness that he sees in general, that people connect their own good with the good of the community. So um, the breakdown of aristocratic privilege and the triumph of the sovereignty of the people had two key, it, it did two key things. It freed people to pursue their own self-interest and it connected the self-interest of ordinary people with the interests of the community. And this is why in his analysis, Americans were so ready to participate in politics, not just in their towns, but everywhere, um, at, at all levels. And you may recall that he talks about individualism, and that certainly <coughs> is one of his themes. <coughs> individualism is um, his word for disengagement and withdrawal from the political community. But he does talk about individualism, but he talks about it as a threat. And he says that Americans are combating individualism. Um, and the name of the chapter in which he talks about individualism, is, or about self-interest rightly understood, rather, is how Americans are combating individualism with self-interest rightly understood. So he does talk about individualism, but he says Americans are doing a good job of restraining it. And even, he says at one point, that they have defeated it. They've managed to defeat the tendency of people to kind of want to disengage. Um, so he saw Americans actively and energetically weaving a new social fabric for themselves in order to replace the older one, um, the aristocratic one, the hierarchical one that was being left behind. <coughs> and he was very impressed by what he saw. <coughs> so that's the positive. But from the moment that he began to analyze the American character, Tocqueville noted that the energy of Americans was somewhat frantic. Um, he wrote that they felt pushed by an irresistible need for action. He's, he noted that Americans were constantly on the move, constantly changing occupations and locations. He noted that they threw themselves into paid work, and when they were done with paid work, they threw themselves into politics. And even when they were done with politics, they didn't seem to know what to do with their leisure time. They would throw themselves in a camper and you know, go across the country, or whatever the 1830s version of a camper was. Um, that, you know, they, would, they, they didn't have a good um, sense of how to be still, how to be at leisure in a calmer way. And he described, even when he describes their political participation, he describes Americans 
scurrying from one political meeting to the next, um, making speeches about things that they don't really <coughs> uh, care about or understand, um, issues that are you know, far removed from their own lives. And he says that they turn to politics for entertainment, in part because they lack decent entertainment in any other form. So uh, the character of the political involvement, in other words, that he saw um, was such that, that it served as a vehicle for keeping busy in, in, some, uh, in some degree. Um, now, so that thought that there is something frantic about American energy and activity is already present in volume one, even earlier in his journals. Um, but after writing volume one, uh, he, uh, in between writing volume one and volume two, Tocqueville decided to go back and read the history of Western political thought, more or less. Um, and uh, that led him to think more deeply than he had before about, in, in a big way about the human condition and about human nature and human needs and desires. And so you see a change, a shift of emphasis in volume two and where he really begins to speak about democracy much more in terms of and in light of his understanding of the needs of um, human beings and what human beings need and want by nature. And so the frenzied character of American energy starts to look different um, and takes on a different cast when it's viewed in terms of um, human nature. <clears throat> One notable example of the heightened concern with and attention to human nature um, comes at the beginning of volume two. And that is um, uh, uh, in his discussion of the intellectual effects of democracy. So this is what I, this sort of thing is what I'm talking about. He notes in this uh, part of the book that democratic peoples tend to be utilitarian in their approach to knowledge, in the pursuit of knowledge. And he says, democracy encourages utilitarianism because, precisely because in a socially and economically mobile society, you can do something with whatever knowledge you acquire. So, people's minds readily leap to the practical applications of whatever they learn, and they prioritize that. <clears throat> and this makes us very productive and resourceful. But it also, he says, encourages a readiness to rest satisfied with a superficial understanding of things. And utilitarianism makes people impatient. It makes them eager to skip to the end, to get the takeaway message, to break out the highlighter, and just say, I'm just going to get the main points. And that makes it hard, he says, for people to delve deeply and wholeheartedly into learning something. Tocqueville calls <clears throat> habitual inattention the disease of the democratic mind. And this, he says, frustrates the mind's natural desire for a higher kind of thought. So you see there the thought of human nature and judging the effects of democracy by the standard of human nature coming um, clearly into view. <clears throat> but intellectual frustrations turn out to be a prelude to a deeper spiritual frustration, which he talks about later in the book. And where this really comes out is about midway through the book, um, in uh, midway through volume two, in this chapter called Why Americans Are So Restless in the Midst of Their Prosperity. And in this chapter, he describes how Americans are always on the move, never at rest, never seeming to attain tranquility or contentment um, of the kind that people often have in, in places where there's far less material wealth. And he notes that people are anxious and, and unhappy in the United States despite having so many possibilities before them. He doesn't use the word because it's not really in use yet, but what he seems to be noticing is that we're all very stressed out. That's basically what he describes. Now, one of the key causes of the restlessness that he sees and that he identifies is the overwhelming focus on material goods. So he locates the restlessness in that. And he says that democracy opens up the prospect of enjoying material goods uh, for most people, but also the prospect of losing them. And that makes people really value them and cling to them because they feel that those goods are precarious, their possession of them is precarious. But also, 
He says that democratic con social conditions magnify the importance of material goods because they make, democratic social conditions make material wealth the only arbiter of success. So in a, it, he says that it's not, it's not that the people in democracies are shallow in caring so much about money, it's not that they're petty, it's that money really is more important in democracies than it is in, it, certainly in aristocracy and in most regimes. Because where birth and name cease to matter, money is the only source of power and prestige. So it be, takes on this much greater significance. Now the focus on material goods is problematic in his view for a couple of reasons. One is, People have unrealistic hopes about how many material goods and how much material prosperity they can acquire. And he says, even in a democracy, even you know, where the rigid, fixed social classes of aristocracy have been uh, dismantled, there are still limits. There are still um, uh, restraints on, you know, constraints on how far most people can move up the socioeconomic ladder. And, and that's harder to see in democracies because it isn't so clear. And he says those constraints only get stronger and tighter with industrialization. So as the economy moves in a more industrial direction, or uh, uh, the direction of uh, manufacturing and industry, um, people's choices, uh, the choices and, and prospects for ordinary people become more limited, but their desires expand. And in a line of reasoning that the Rousseauians in the room will recognize, um, and I know there are some, Tocqueville argues that the progress of industrialization creates new things for people to want. And then those wants become experienced as needs. And so people who wouldn't necessarily have needed something one day feel a, a desperate need for it the next. And the enjoyment of material goods is also comparative. So, a big part of what people, how people experience material prosperity is through their comparison of their own wealth with others. And the people of modern democracies are continually confronted with other people who have more than they do. And there's no ready answer. The society doesn't give people any ready answer as to why some people should have more than others. So it's hard to bear because it seems especially unjust that some people should have more than others. In a social situation in which there's no clear moral justification for inequality, <clears throat> it's just a fact. So one of the main um, sources of, of restlessness in his view is the love of material goods, but the other source is envy, the, the anger and resentment that people feel at not having um, as much as, as the people around them. The deepest problem, though, in Tocqueville's view, is also the simplest one, which is that material enjoyments are not satisfying. Those who seek them are always rushing to find the next satisfaction. They're always plagued by the thought that they're running out of time. Because material goods are fleeting, they can never bring lasting satisfaction. Human beings naturally yearn for a more solid, enduring happiness. The incomplete joys of this world, he writes, can never satisfy man's heart. What he implies in that statement, he says elsewhere, very directly, which is that belief in the immortality of the soul plays a critical role in human happiness. He calls religion one of the constituent principles of human nature. Now, he himself was never sure of the existence of a higher power, but he was sure that it was part of human nature to hope for one. The soul has needs that must be satisfied, he argues. And whatever care you take to distract it from itself, it soon grows bored, restless, and agitated amid the enjoyment of the senses. Now, just because people become more materialistic and more focused on material goods doesn't turn them into atheists. It doesn't mean they cease to believe in a higher power or in the immortality of the soul. And I think he grants that. But he does see a connection between the two things. He sees a connection between the focus on material goods and the weakening of religious belief. Because he argues that the love of material goods tends to crowd out man's religious impulses. That's the way he puts it. 
Um, by turning people's focus to the body instead of the soul, and also by turning people's focus to the present rather than to the past or the future, the love of material goods blocks the soul's view of the rest of the world, he says, and sometimes comes between the soul and God. So the way he conceives of it is that one, one sort of blocks out the other, even if they're not, um, even if they don't come into conflict um, necessarily or logically. Now all of this is to say, to sum it up, that Tocqueville thought that Americans look for happiness in the wrong place. Now, that I think is true, and I think it's worth pondering, but it's not earth shattering. Uh, so I want to turn next to the thing that I think is especially interesting, which is his account of what happens to those impulses that aren't so easy to satisfy in modern democracy, those impulses that life in modern democracy turns us away from. So um, starting with, sticking with um, religion for a moment, starting with the religious impulse. Tocqueville does not argue that the religious impulse is dying out in America. So that's, it's not so simple as that. He doesn't say, oh, and now religion is weakening. He does say that in some ways, in some, um, <clears throat> he, does, he does think it's weakening. But he also thinks that Christianity is very strong, very culturally dominant in the United States. So it's, it's complicated. Um, he doesn't simply think that it's, it's weak. Um, rather, he notes two particular developments occurring in the realm of religion. The first one relates to the way in which Christianity is enduring in America. He observes that Christianity is retaining much of its strength in the United States by conforming itself to the dictates of modern morality. So American religious leaders, he says, emphasize that piety is beneficial to people, that it's good for them, that it serves their self-interests to be pious. So religious leaders appeal to people's self-interest, and not only in the next life, but also in this life. And pious Americans, he says, often profess that they believe or they behave as good Christians because they see it in their best interest to do so. They think it's good for them or beneficial. So what he's saying is that they frame their piety in their own minds as self-serving, um, as an act of, of self-interest rather than as self-sacrificing. So they, they reconceive of it in this way. And Tocqueville says that he thinks that they underestimate their own capacity for selflessness. So that's, the, that's one development. The other development, he noticed, was that piety of a very different variety, of a much more old-fashioned, primal variety, what he calls excited spiritualism, occasionally flares up in bursts in America. In brief intervals, he says, when their souls seem suddenly to break the material bonds that hold it and to escape impetuously toward heaven. He describes camp meetings where um, you know, people flock to a, a meeting from, they flock from miles around and they lose themselves in religious enthusiasm for days. He witnessed one of these. And this phenomenon of people seized with religious fervor, he says, is a backlash. It's a backlash against the overwhelming emphasis in American life on material goods. Men stray from religious belief only with the aid of a type of moral violence, he says, against their own nature. An invincible inclination brings them back. So since the longing for immortality is stifled and suppressed by American materialism, that longing comes out in extreme and distorted ways. That seems to be his assessment. And he didn't seem to think that that kind of reaction would ever become the norm. The norm would be restlessness, which he saw everywhere. Um, but he does seem to think that those kinds of bursts of spiritualism would never die out, that they would never um, altogether go away. Because, he says, the taste for the infinite and the love of what is immortal have their unchanging foundation in man's nature. They exist despite his efforts. He can hinder them, uh, hinder and deform them, but not destroy them. Okay, so to restate, Tocqueville notes two things happening to the religious impulse in the modern democratic era. On the one hand, the vast majority of people 
a reconceiving of their piety in terms that reconcile it with modern principles, rendering it a form of self-concern. And on the other hand, the religious impulse, uh, in a more sort of basic, old-fashioned sense, occasionally bursts forth in belts of great enthusiasm or spiritualism. Now, the, now, religion and the longing for immortality are things that he talks a lot about, but they are also, um, the religious, religious longing is one of a broader category of longings, as he sees it, uh, for things that go beyond you know, material enjoyments. So he thinks there are natural impulses in the soul that towards self-forgetting or self-transcendence. And religion, the religious impulse, is just one of those. One impulse towards something that would promise a deeper kind of satisfaction than material goods. And so I want to highlight two others besides religion and look at how, what he thinks happens to those. The first one is the desire to be good, what the ancients would call the love of virtue. Tocqueville's understanding of the fate of this longing uh, comes out in his discussion of self-interest rightly understood. Now, for those unfamiliar with this phrase, Tocqueville argues that there are two different ways of understanding self-interest, right? Uh, self-interest in an enlightened way or in a narrow way. The narrow way is to think in terms of crude, simple selfishness, so just, you know, give me more stuff. The enlightened way is to see that serving the community also serves, uh, you know, benefits oneself. So the enlightened person sees the link between the common good and one's own good. Uh, now, in his discussion of that principle, Tocqueville takes the modern embrace of self-interest as given. He says that's, it's, it's not going anywhere. The only question in the modern world is whether people will understand their self-interest um, in a narrow way or an enlightened way, but they're going to be self-interested. That change, he says, the, the change in the dominant moral outlook away from devotion and toward the pursuit of self-interest and the embrace of that, it's irreversible. But he also notes that the impulse towards self-forgetting, like the religious impulse, does not simply drop away in the democratic era. People are still moved to serve others. So he says, in the United States, no less than elsewhere, you see people sometimes yielding to the disinterested, spontaneous impulses that are part of man's nature. But, he says, Americans seldom admit that they give in to enthusiasms of this kind. What, he, what happens, he says, is that they explain their selfless behavior as a form of self-concern. He says it pleases Americans to explain their public service in terms of self-interest. People want to be public-spirited, in other words, but they need a way to justify it to themselves as rational. So the doctrine of self-interest rightly understood allows them to reconceive or re-describe their selfless behavior as a form of self-interest. So Americans put themselves through complicated mental gymnastics in order to satisfy their basic impulse to be good. And for the most part, it works. He says they do. Um, you know, they serve their communities, they think it's in their best interests, it is in their interests, and, and it's all to the good. But is there any parallel in morality to the other element of what happens um, to the religious impulse? So you see this reconceiving of it on the one hand, <coughs> but does a purer version of the impulse towards self-forgetting also show up in the moral realm, and does it flare up in some strange and unexpected way? Is there an equivalent of the camp meeting? The answer is yes. Um, not quite, it's not quite the, as recognizable um, as you know, a camp meeting. But Tocqueville says that the impulse toward self-forgetting tends to reveal itself in commerce. He says Americans, the lengths to which an American merchant will go to triumph over his competitors, uh, living for weeks on stale water and bread, desperately shaving a few days off of his trade route to beat his competitors to their customers, um, can only be described as a kind of heroism. And he likens it to the heroism of the nobles in the French Revolution who renounced their privileges. Um, and he says, in acting in this way, the American is not just responding to a calculation, 
but obeying the dictates of his nature. But of course, the self-forgetting of the American merchant is crucially different from that of the French noble because the self-forgetting uh, of the American merchant is not in the service of a moral end. It's in the service of profit. Um, and so it's an empty kind of selflessness. Um, it's not really um, likely to produce the kind of satisfaction that one can take in doing good for others. So if Tocqueville is right, then both religious and moral longings persist in the democratic era but they become harder to see because we find ways to recast uh, any impulses or inclinations that seem indicative of such longings as something different, as expressions of self-concern. And we might see rare manifestations of them around the edges of our society, but the dominant culture discourages them, and the more they are suppressed and discouraged, the rarer and stranger those manifestations become. Now I mentioned a third uh, uh, type of desire or longing um, for something beyond material prosperity. And that is the longing for distinction, for some kind of honor. Tocqueville seems to have taken for granted that um, it's natural for people to want a certain amount of honor and esteem. And you see that in various ways throughout the work. Um, he, he seems to have taken uh, it for granted that there will always be individuals that want to distinguish themselves. Um, and uh, it's one of the things that he praises about life in New England towns, that it allows ordinary people to have some measure of honor and esteem because they are governing themselves, and that's a kind of dignified thing to do. Um, <coughs> but eventually, he observed that democracy was changing ambition. It was allowing ambition to spread throughout society, but it was also encouraging a certain kind of ambition. It was a kind of ambition that was modest and methodical and aimed mostly at material goods. Grand ambition, high ambition, was discouraged by democracy. And not only because democracy busies people, although that is part of it, not only because it busies them with the pursuit of material goods, but also because it's, it was changing, he thought, the way that people thought about themselves and their own capacities. And they were coming to think that they were born only to the enjoyment of material pleasures and tended not to demand great or daring actions from themselves. He thought democracy weakened people's sense of their power as individuals. He thought it made people see human agency as narrow. And it, he said that it was even contributing to their doubt about whether there's uh, about the existence of free will, um, and made people in general see themselves as passive participants in a world that a uh, historical process that's beyond their control. Beyond their control. Um, so for a lot of reasons, he thought that democracy was um, discouraging ambition. But, um, uh, and so for the most part, the ambition he did see had it adapted itself to the conditions. But he, he also mentions that the other kind of ambition, the grand, high kind of ambition, the risk-taking kind, doesn't simply die out in the modern democratic era. And when it does show up, he says, it's, uh, it has a violent, revolutionary character. So here, too, he seems to have thought that there was um, this tendency for this longing, because it was so, so um, uh, countercultural. To, uh, to, for the most part, be suppressed, but that when it does arise, it tends to sort of burst forth in a more extreme form than, than uh, it would have otherwise. Um, now, partly that's because he thought that um, anybody who does anything radically countercultural, even if the culture is wrong and the person is right, um, he, he seems to have thought that people who do those sorts of things don't tend to have a very good character. <laughs> and so um, he says, the same energy that impels a man to rebel in a violent way against a common error almost always carries him beyond the bounds of reason. In order for a man to declare war, even legitimate war, on the ideas of his time and country, he must have a certain violent and adventurous cast of mind. And men of this character, no matter what direction they take, rarely arrive at happiness and virtue. But he also thought that there were no um, social or political mechanisms for educating or enlightening ambition, for, for making a place for it. <clears throat> so 
he predicted that very ambitious people in democracies would um, tend to think in terms of short-term success and in terms of popularity rather than lasting achievements. That they would be um, less responsible than leaders in earlier eras. He doesn't quite put it that way, but that's what he seems to think. So high ambition, in other words, or the desire for real distinction, like the religious impulse, is distorted into something more extreme and more dangerous by the lack of conventional outlets for it. Um, there's other problems with, with ambition as well that I think make he, that he, reasons he thought that it was especially, a, a democracy was an especially inhospitable um, environment for grand ambition. Um, but um, I want to make sure I uh, keep things brief. So, um, uh, I'll just leave it at that for the, the, the three different longings that he thought were um, not really satisfied in, in the modern democratic era and, and what he saw happening to them. So, um, let me say that it's, it's ironic, I think, it's, and, and surprising that democracy should create an environment in which a number of important human longings are frustrated because, in a sense, democracy allows for an unprecedented focus on the meeting of human needs, right? I mean, democracy focuses new attention on the human being understood as an abstract ideal, according to Tocqueville, and the changes in the modern moral outlook um, liberate people to, to pursue their own self-interest. And the structure of society allows people to organize their lives in accord with their inclinations and desires. So the destruction of aristocracy frees people from, their, from the obligations and restraints that had bound them to their families and their positions and their classes. And those were all burdens they didn't choose and would presumably want to be liberated from. Um, even the great danger that Tocqueville identifies with democracy, namely individualism, he describes as excessive self-absorption. Um, in America, he says, man is today driven back on himself by an irresistible force. So democracy would seem to represent the opening up of limitless possibilities for the satisfaction of the self. But as that very quote that I just mentioned suggests, Tocqueville sees democratic man's focus on himself as counterproductive. He holds that the deepest human satisfactions come through self-transcendence or self-forgetting. And if one thing comes out of his account most clearly, it is that he thinks that democratic man is in danger of losing the ability to forget himself. So Tocqueville saw religious and moral longings as discouraged and suppressed and crowded out by a sober, plodding materialism. He saw loftier impulses flaring up in strange and confined ways, and pride and ambition vastly diminishing, but also re-emerging in rare but destructive ways. He thought democracy was fairer than aristocracy, but he seemed to think that that superior fairness came at a considerable cost, that important human needs were more difficult to satisfy in democracies, and not just for aristocrats, but everybody. So let me just return to the, the opening of my talk and, and how Tocqueville's insights help us to understand modern democratic discontent and what contribution they might make. Um, we began by noting that Tocqueville thought that democracy gave people a sense of ownership over their communities and the sense that they have a share in decision making. He thought democracy gave them a strong sense of legitimacy, the legitimacy of their government, and gave rise to this new form of public spiritedness. And he also thought that the hope of a more prosperous future also fueled a general vitality. I think if Tocqueville could see us in the 21st century, he would ask whether ordinary people still have a sense of future prosperity. He would ask whether we're losing our sense of ownership over our communities whether a strong sense that we are stakeholders in our communities still undergirds democratic legitimacy. And he would ask whether we are still defeating individualism, um, or whether individualism has not now gotten the upper hand. And with respect to individual flourishing, he would ask whether in all our productivity, we are distracted and preoccupied unable to name or understand longings that make themselves felt in dim and distorted ways. 
His argument speaks most of all to why it is difficult to understand our own malaise. If Tocqueville's analysis is accurate, it means that we are more removed from certain longings of the human soul than were people of earlier eras. Those longings remain with us, but they are harder to recognize because any sign of them tends to be overlaid with and obscured by the modern embrace of self-interest. Impulses towards self-forgetting are quickly rationalized and minimized as forms of self-concern. In the rare moments when they do burst forth, unmistakably, in plain sight, so when people rebel against the prudent, moderate, materialistic spirit of our age, either through selfless action or through some high and grand form of striving, such efforts seem especially countercultural, extreme, and irrational. We don't see the longing for self-transcendence very often or very clearly, and what we do see of it is backlash, overreaction to a world devoid of it, and therefore a distortion. So in Tocqueville's analysis, the people of modern democracies inevitably misunderstand themselves. And in particular, they think themselves less capable of self-sacrifice than they are. The longing for self-transcendence is not only more difficult to satisfy, but also more difficult to recognize and understand. And if that's right, if he's correct, in a way it's good news because it means that we are capable of more than we think. But it means that we will have a harder time than people of previous eras in arriving at an understanding of what we long for and why. And so our path to self-knowledge in comparison to that of people of previous eras is a longer and steeper climb. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions, so you can field them yourself. Yeah. <coughs> yes. So is this inability or distancing from the self an inevitable outgrowth of all democratic societies, or is it a particular uh, feature of American democracy? That's a good question. Um, you might notice that in that talk, I was I kept referring to modern democracy. And I did that for a reason, because Tocqueville ostensibly is talking about all democratic societies. It's what he says he's doing. But I think if you read carefully, you see that he's actually talking about democracy in modernity. He's talking about modern liberal democracy, the kind of regime that you know the United States has and also you know much of Europe. It's not he doesn't really mean all democratic societies. Um, if you look at the things he says about other instances of um, apparently democratic regimes, he tends to say they weren't really democracies in one way or another. Um, so I think that what he, what he really wants to try to capture and characterize is life in the modern West. Um, you mentioned a lot that we recontextualize things as being in our self-interest, but if we truly do have a deep desire to do these things, is it still not in our self-interest to do them? Like, even if we're recontextualizing them, they still make us happy, man, so it's still in our self-interest. Yes. Okay, so I think, if I understand what you're asking, I mean, that's certainly what Tocqueville thinks, is that, um, for instance, in, in calling the, the moral outlook of Americans self-interest rightly understood, Tocqueville is himself making a judgment. He's, he's throwing his own weight behind the idea that people really are serving their self-interests by serving the common good. He's saying they understand their self-interests in the right way. So. I think he does think it's it's good for them to serve the community. The difficulty comes in, it's not, it's not a practical difficulty. So in his mind, people are still doing the things they need to do. They're still serving the community in the ways that the community needs. But 
what I was highlighting is that he does suggest that they misunderstand what they're doing, that they have a bad conscience about having a good conscience. And so they don't see their own desire to devote themselves to something. At least they don't see it clearly. And that has some implications. Yeah? And it, it strikes me that these longings suggest that maybe sort of the comprehensive critique of Tocqueville is that a modern democracy can't reckon with the prospect of death for a human being. I mean, these three longings seem to be the, we lose our religious impulse, the impulse that would help us to reckon with what happens after we die. Um, there's the longing to be good, um, whether in sort of a outwards, in a virtuous sense, the sense to sort of become someone who is above uh, the material things, and the outward sense to become someone who is on to other people, going for honor to leave something behind. Yeah. And these things can be the, the problem is this sort of conservative materiality. It starts to put the self-forgetting of Tocqueville is principally a, a self-forgetting of the fact that there needs to be something more than just some sort of simple perpetuation of life. Uh, but I like this. But that doesn't actually come up in any of these passages, it seems. It's only sort of oblique threat. Is there somewhere in Tocqueville where there's sort of direct reference? Well, yes. And I, I mean, I think that's absolutely right what you say. And it does come up in the sense that the immortality of the soul is how he, that's the way he understands the importance of religion, is that it allows people to believe in the immortality of the soul. So there you have death as a problem, right? Um, and he does talk about, he talks about American attitudes towards death in various places, never to, not in a, you know, um, elaborate way, but um, I mean, the line that comes to mind is, um, he says, Americans arrive at the abyss without ever having thought of it before. So that very, his, and that's from the, the chapter on restlessness. So it's very much um, uh, uh, in his thoughts about restlessness that Americans are fleeing the thoughts of death and trying and failing to make themselves happy by a method that won't ever really satisfy them by buying stuff. So yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah? Um, when you think about how Tocqueville is understood today and used today, and what I mean by used is appropriated mm -hmm. by this political party or that political party, um, the assumption seems to be uh, that Tocqueville, at least when he wrote The Democracy, believed that there was some sort of solution to the problem of democracy that the book articulates. Um, it's not clear to me whether your analysis leads to the conclusion that Tocqueville himself didn't think that there was any solution. There may be mitigations, but no solution. And I think there's a lot of evidence that Tocqueville himself came to believe as he became a fully mature uh, person that uh, any solution that he thought was possible when he wrote The Democracy had already failed. So I'm wondering how you understand Tocqueville's own stance on this question of whether or not um, uh, the the fundamental problem of democracy, as he articulates it, has uh, some sort of, not just intellectual solution, as much we can understand it as a problem, we can understand why it's a problem, we can understand, and we can do this or that to try to mitigate it, but as someone suggested, that ultimately uh, every such regime will fail to deal with it because it can't. So could you talk a little bit? Yeah, um, so if if what you mean by the problem of democracy is the problem that I'm outlining, right? Because he does see more than one problem with democracy. Yes. Problems with you know keeping uh, maintaining liberty, for example, that's you know a whole nother can of worms. But if we're talking about the problems here, I would say 
I don't think he does see a, a perfect solution by any means. Um, he, because, because it's sewn, you know, very tightly into the fabric of modern democratic life that we, you know, would have this, that, that certain longings would be encouraged and others discouraged. And, you know, he seems to have really um, rejected the thought that you're going to have perfect solutions to any social and political problems. You know, he, he hated any um, kind of theories that suggested that. Um, that were already kicking around in you know in, in the 1830s and beyond. So he he seems to have thought you know the best you can do is to try to um, see the cultural tendencies that are the most deeply problematic and try to limit them, try to counteract them. Um, so for example, you know when he talks about the intellectual tendencies of democracy, he ends up saying you know at least some people should be reading the Greeks. Um, they should be, because that's really hard to do. You can't really multitask while you're reading the Greeks. You can't be impatient. So he says that would be a good thing for people to do, to kind of exercise a certain mental muscle that they don't usually have to use. That is how I see that, um, the, his overall approach, which is to try to, um, to counteract some of the tendencies that are the most problematic. Um, uh, around you know as best we can, but not that, not that there's any way to fundamentally change the situation. Can I? Can I yeah, follow? please. Uh, um, it, it's also not clear from your analysis uh, um, whether or not. Uh, Tocqueville's diagnosis, which as you suggest is very deep, and which seems to be fundamentally, let's say, classical in its inspiration. Um, it, it, it seems to me hard, even granting everything you've said is correct, um, to leave it at that uh, without asking the question of whether Tocqueville himself supplies us with any kind of guidance concerning um, the problem of self-transcendence and its connection to happiness. In other words, in your view, does Tocqueville stay within the horizon uh, which you place the most emphasis on? Uh, we have these longings. Things would be better if we treated these longings in a different way, if we didn't thwart them, force them underground, if we acknowledge them, if we, for example, uh, um, encourage the belief that uh, virtue is good in itself, uh, if we encourage the belief that various fine kinds of self-sacrifice, and, and I, I would say, self-sacrifice, even going beyond Christian self-sacrifice, political self-sacrifice, uh, this uh, worldly self-sacrifice. But it was, in your view, is Tocqueville himself, does he himself believe that? Or is this uh, whole horizon within which he is discussing this uh, um, only part of a larger understanding of human being? Which would, one which would at least call into question whether such a view is uh, philosophically coherent. Which view? The view that uh, um, self-sacrifice is good for you. I don't think he ever takes that up. I think there are certain limits to his analysis, mm -hmm. and I don't think that he goes that deep, so to speak. I mean, I think he... When in he, his own mind or just in the book? Well, I can't speak to his mind. All I have is the book and the things that he wrote, and I don't see any sign of it. Let me put it that way. I don't see any sign of that, and I think, you know, I think we can, um, we can be grateful for his having, you know, I would say, diagnosed in an incredibly compelling and profound way the modern condition without, you know, um, faulting him for not having gone beyond that. But I would say, so, you know, I don't see him having a 
really um, uh, any kind of systematic, um, at least not that I can think of, any systematic treatment of the question of whether one can really find one's truest good in, um, you know, whether it makes sense to, to, to be selfless and whether it, the, the idea that through being selfless you can reach your greatest, you know, your own greatest good, whether that's coherent. There's nothing, he's not, he, that's not what he does. And, and I would also say, and this is something of an admission about what I'm doing here is, you know, all of this, he doesn't exactly say any of this on purpose <laughs> in the sense that he's not, I'm culling this from his, his attempt to do something somewhat different. So he's, you know, he's talking about the fate of liberty in the modern world. This is there, but he's, he doesn't seem to have set out to give an account of the longings that go unsatisfied in the modern world, but he does. And, and on the question of whether it's a classical understanding or not, which you mentioned, I think it is, it is quite, there's a lot of parallels, but it's, it's also um, between the way he saw things and the way somebody like Plato or Aristotle would see them, but there's also a healthy dose of Pascal in there and Rousseau, so it's a bit of a mix. It's a bit of a blend of different thinkers. Um, it's not systematic at all, and, and maybe if it had been more systematic, we would have gotten clearer answers to the kinds of questions that you're raising. Yeah? One of the basic questions that arises from democracy in America and from your talk about it is, um, in the final analysis, does Tocqueville think that democracy or aristocracy is superior? In a way, he, he's always raising that question. He's pointing to ways in which one is better in this respect or the other is better in mm -hmm. that respect. But he also kind of, treat, in a certain way, treats it as a moot question because yes. he has right. this whole account of history. Right. That's beside the point. We're stuck yes. with democracy. But you can't help but wonder, well, <laughs> right. should, we, should we greet the dis, this dispensation of history if that's what it is? as a good thing in the decisive respect, or as a bad thing, even if maybe there are a lot of good things that come with it. And you, um, in your talk, referred to his line that democracy is fairer or more just than yes. aristocracy, and that seem, would seem to be something very much in its favor. But then you've emphasized throughout your talk there are all kinds of really important ways in which democracy really alienates us from what would seem to make us happy. So it's, it's hard to know what to I mean, do we say yeah. democracy is better because it's more just, or is, does justice require that we're really screwed up psychologically and we can't be happy, <laughs> or what? So do you, do you think so. he has an ultimate judgment on this question? Um, I'd just be curious to know what you yeah, think Yeah, you know, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I agree that the way I would put it is that he imposes a very harsh discipline on himself, so that whenever he starts to head down into the, the direction of saying, aristocracy would be better in this way, he immediately, you know, he says, I'm not going there <laughs> because that is a settled question. So, and part, it's also further complicated by the fact that he is also so convinced that attempts to go back are so counterproductive and are making problems worse, right? So, you know, the whole attempt in the introduction to the first, you know, volume is, is to say to people, look, there's no going back. You, you got to become part of the solution, not part of the problem. So it's hard to tell. Um, I, the best I can tell is that he really does, he did seem to think that, that aristocracy had a lot of cruelty and severity in it that was problematic and that democracy is better because it is fairer and it really does, um, it's more humane and fairer, but that doesn't quite amount to being better, um, simply. Um, he seems to have thought there were advantages and disadvantages to both, and that's not a very um, satisfying answer, but it's the best one I can see. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said several times that he believed that this inability to reconcile our desire to do good and our materialism would lead to violent backlashes. But yet in the democracies where materialism conflicts with 
um, the innate desires of people, you often see democracies that are far more peaceful than other forms of government. Well, he doesn't say that, that it's going to lead to violent backlash against materialism. He said an extreme backlash. Yeah, right. He, didn't, he doesn't ever say it's going to lead to you know, violence. On the contrary, he says it's actually going to lead to a, a, a world in which you don't see as much violence and you don't see many revolutions, by which he means not just revolutions in our sense, but also drastic changes or upheavals. He says those are going to become rarer precisely because people are more materialistic, that makes them more sensible, makes them more practical. Um, so, so he doesn't seem to have um, thought that uh, democracies would be more violent. So um, what are these backlashes exactly? So the, back, the, the violence of the backlashes, um, when he uses the, the word, he means um, he, he's using it in the sense of um, being very extreme, very dramatic. And so, and the, the ones that I was talking about in the talk um, are um, things like uh, uh, the um, uh, great religious enthusiasms that he witnessed. So in other words, an extreme rejection of middle class bourgeois American life. Extreme rejections of that in one way or another, in one direction or another. So people who decide to go off and live dramatically different lives from the rest of us. Um, that's, what, that's what I meant to say. Um, he seemed to think there would, there would always be some level of that. Most people would just be sort of unhappy, vaguely unhappy, a little lost, a, you know, somewhat dissatisfied, not quite sure why, and they would just muddle through. And then some people would have a, some, you know, few amount of people would have a really dramatic reaction. Thank you. Yes. Can I just follow up on that? Because yes. when you had first mentioned backlashes, I was thinking of national socialism and the, mm -hmm. uh, I, the, the backlash mm -hmm. that grew out of the Weimar Republic. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, maybe yeah. I'm mistaken, but I thought something like that mm -hmm. would fit into Tocqueville's mold. Does yeah, have that I think kind of that's thing? right. Yeah. I think that's that makes sense. So that you could you could also go in that direction. And I mean, I don't know that he necessarily does, but I think you could connect it with what he says. Um, and I think the other thing that he would say about that is that you know he has a chapter on the belief in indefinite perfectibility and how how much that's also a really strong tendency of people in democracies to believe in limitless. Um, possibility for progress and improvement, and you you can really see there how he understood ideology and how powerful that would be for people in democracies because that, how powerfully attractive it would be, um, and so I think certain things, yeah, I think he would probably point to that as an explanation for the phenomena you you point to, and also. Um, yeah, I think it would be certainly part of the backlash against kind of um, the <coughs> embrace of self-interest. Yeah. yeah. So um, Tocqueville does sort of identify at the start that this might not just be a uniquely American thing, that democracy is coming and it's going to be yep. here eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and we treat America as this like clean slate frontier democracy. Mm -hmm. Is it just more visible, these three, the, the longings and this self-interest problem, is that just more visible in America, or is it something they identify as like, as a problem that aristocracies transitioning to democracies will also face? Yeah, the latter for sure. He doesn't think that these things just exist in America. And, you know, he's, his ultimate interest at a practical level was not really America, but France. And in some ways, I think he thought the problems were not as bad in America as they were in France. So, for instance, he thought religion was stronger in, in America, was stronger, um, is stronger um, still. So, so um, you know, obviously he has the most to say about America in Democracy in America, um, but he, uh, he certainly doesn't seem to want to characterize just America. And, and also, interestingly, 
with the second volume of Democracy in America, um, he didn't want to title it. The, the title of it was not Democracy in America. It was um, on the influence of equality on the ideas and sentiments of men or something along those lines. I don't know if I have it every word, but it was not, America wasn't in it um, when he sent it to the publisher. And then the publisher said, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is Democracy in America part two. <laughs> because the first one was a bestseller and we want another bestseller. Um, so he really didn't understand himself to be speaking primarily about America, especially in the second volume. And he starts speaking instead about democratic centuries or democratic eras but then I think there really it turns out there are no other democratic eras in the way he understands it except this one so yeah um, I was wondering if we could go back to something you said in response to an earlier question um, and uh, I, it, it seemed to be something like this that uh, you had to excavate this analysis uh, and that Somehow, Tocqueville did not intend to write a book. That, uh, that's actually quite interesting. I, I, I'm not sure the excavate is the right word because it is right there. I mean, uh, and 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 furthermore, um, uh, I, I'm trying to get back to the question of Tocqueville's self-understanding as, as, as uh, you see it. Uh, his discussions of religion and his discussion of Pascal, for example, uh, certainly seems to be a platform upon which one could sort of do what you did. Uh, and I, I suspect that, that it's more or less what he did. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering, just a simple question. I mean, do you think Tocqueville himself was happy? No, no, that's an easy one. No, absolutely not. He's very clear about that. He says he is tortured by restlessness. <laughs> he well, says he is but terribly he's, but he's tormented. Not by he's not tortured by the same restlessness that tortures uh, the ordinary American. No, but it was restlessness, and he calls it that, and he says he's tormented by it, and he says he envies his wife, who doesn't seem to be nearly so restless. Um, so, but what's but it, what? So do is do, do an analysis of Tocqueville's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, okay. because that's very striking about him. I mean, he's not a serene. <laughs> no, he's, he's, not, he's serene, not serene. Uh, so I don't person. think he exempts himself from um, from his analysis. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't a, uh, somebody who's very interested in material goods. So that part of it, I don't think, applies to him. Um, he does seem to have been somewhat tortured by the fact that, and tortured is too strong, it, he, he doesn't seem, the best we can tell, he doesn't seem to have been a religious believer, and that seems to have been a disappointment to him. And when he talks about the um, experience of losing his belief, and then when he talks in other places about the way that unbelievers feel towards believers, it's very clear that that was not a, it was a, it was a source of unhappiness to him that he didn't believe. Um, so, so there's that element. Um, and then with respect to political ambition, he had a lot of it. I mean, it was, the, it was the reason he wrote the book. And his political ambitions were never really satisfied. It was an exercise in um, frustration for him to be part of democratic politics. He, he never succeeded very well in it, in part because he was so naturally aristocratic. There's this one part where he says, you know, in one of his journals where he says, I, um, or a letter, he says, you know, I had to stand for election in my district, and the people wanted to know what I thought. <laughs> said, I answered none of their insolent questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he never made my, as you no doubt know, he, he was, you know, very high up in the government, and eventually, after 1848, and was, you know, in the Chamber of Deputies for a long time, but he never succeeded much, and that was a source of, of great unhappiness to him. And then, you know, but then eventually he had to retire from political life altogether, um, and um, he took solace in his books and in his happy marriage, and that seems to have been about the best he could do. It's, 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 uh, because Tokyo seems to be 
if, if uh, you use the terms of your analysis. He doesn't seem to be so much to be an unhappy Democrat. He seems to be an unhappy happy aristocrat. Uh, and Stuck in a democratic world. In, in, in yeah. a democratic world. Yeah. But it's not clear that he would have been a happy aristocrat in the aristocratic world either. Uh, anyway, just. No, I agree. I think he seems to have been somebody who probably would have had, had troubles either way. <laughs> Does Tocqueville think the restlessness is part of the human nature, both in Aristotle's and in Democritus? He seems to think that restlessness um, is a particularly democratic thing. And that's why, um, although he takes his understanding, some of his understanding of restlessness from Pascal, it does differ because he really does, Pascal says it's human nature to be restless. If, especially if you haven't found God, then you're going to be restless. It's part of your, it's part of human nature. But um, I mean, that's a terrible <laughs> boiling down of Pascal. But um, what's different about Tocqueville is that he seems to think that there is a capacity to be restless in human beings, and it gets greatly magnified in democracies because democracy essentially creates conditions in in a whole bunch of ways that um, uh, kind of uh, direct us. Uh, distract us from the things that would really bring us contentment and directs us in, um, towards other things. So he called restlessness um, the, the most common sickness of our time. On that high note, <laughs> I told you it was going to be negative. <laughs> negative. Uh, let's thank Professor Sauber for coming and cheering us all up. Anyone who's here for 